You're listening to Sports Radio Detroit. Sports Radio Detroit is proud to present the Whip and Nene podcast on SportsRadioDetroit.com SRD with your show hosts Pete Spybeck, a broadcaster and horse racing handicapper, and Danny Garuder, a sports writer and horse racing handicapper. This episode welcomes guest host Aaron Hayes, who's a freelance horse racing writer and handicapper. And here- And now here comes the Whip and Nene podcast on SportsRadioDetroit.com with Pete, Dana, and Aaron. Oh yeah, welcome in to another episode of the Whip and Nene podcast here on SportsRadioDetroit.com, SRD. I am indeed one of the show hosts. I am Pete Spivak. You can hear me doing sports and traffic updates in the metro Detroit area. And with me, as usual, are my two usual co-hosts, one being the great Dana Garuda, who's a sports writer in the metro Detroit area. Dana, how are you, buddy? Less than a hundred percent. Oh, let's try to let's try to wheel you wheel you up to a hundred percent as the show goes on, my friend. And our other uh, host here tonight is the great Aaron Hayes. Aaron, welcome in, good my good friend. What's happening? What up? Though? How you doing, Pete? Doing well, doing well on this uh, tournament Thursday, the start of the NCAA tournament. And we are recording on a Thursday. You're listening to this on the uh, second day of the tournament, on a Friday, or possibly on Saturday, the third day of the tournament. So, uh, very long day as I had the day off of work, uh, watching the tournament. I assume you boys are watching basketball as well. One loss so far. One loss. Dana? I, I picked too many upsets. That, that's, that's all I always do there. Well, you're a good man. <laughs> support the Cinderella's support the Cinderella's. Well, what we do here on the Whip and Nene podcast is not break down the NCAA tournament, but we break down the American prep race schedule, which leads to the Kentucky Derby on the first Saturday in May. American, European, and Japanese horses all compete for 20 gates at the Kentucky Derby by racing a 35-race prep schedule, which runs between September and April. All prep races award points to the top four finishers and the top 20 horses with the most points. We'll earn a gate at the Derby, 18 American horses, one spot to the Japanese champ, and one spot to the European champ. So with that, let's get into what happened last week. We had the Rebel Stakes divided into two divisions at the Retirement Villa for both Aaron and Dana. That would be the great Oaklawn Park. But Dana, tell us the story about what happened in Rebels Division 1 and 2, my friend. Well, in Division 1 and Division 2, we had uh, upsets. Uh, the first division went to Long Range Toddy, who had been finishing in the money in some of the other prep races that we really looked at this year. And he broke through in this race for trainer Steve Asmussen and uh, jockey John Court. Uh, just edged out the uh, favorite in that race, Improbable, who was a really heavy, a heavy favorite in that race. But Long Range Toddy... Uh, Kind of went to the lead early, dropped back, and then made a move in the stretch and caught improbable near the wire. Uh, so that was it was an exciting race, uh, and you know, uh, Long Range Toddy earned a 95 buyer speed figure, which is pretty good but not great. Uh, and then we saw Galilean uh, finishing second, another Cal- I should say finishing third, another California Invader, uh, and then we move on to the the second division of the Rebel, which was kind of a similar race in that the heavy favorite game winner finished second. This one was even a lot closer than the first one. It was a nose finish. Omaha Beach, which was ridden by Mike Smith, trained by Richard Mandela, who was the second choice in the race, took the lead in the stretch and just barely held off game winner at the wire, and they were well clear of the rest of the field. Eight and a eight and a quarter lengths in front of the third place finisher, which was Market King. Wasn't a big exact or anything like that. The exact came back about 22 bucks, but uh, both of those horses looked really good finishing one, two. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll see them in one more race before the, uh, before the Derby, which is oh, just a little bit over six weeks away. So with that, I will turn it back over to Pete. Well, I appreciate your breakdown there, Dana. Thanks very much. Aaron, any comments on your two Rebel Stakes? 
Um, pretty much. I think you can really see the layoff from improbable and game winner. Um, it maybe if they were fresh, maybe both of them possibly could have won, but I think the layoff probably hindered both of those from uh, from winning the Rebel Stakes. Gotcha. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Well, uh, another failed favorite. And by the way, uh, Aaron, I forgot to mention this in our pre-show uh, meeting, so I'm just going to do it live on the air. Uh, are you ready to eat some crow with me? I am ready to eat crow. Okay, because you and I both uh, basically told Omaha Beach to go to hell last <laughs> week. Uh, I started it, and you concurred with me. Uh, so I, I want did. to apologize uh, right now to the number six horse in the second division of the Rebel Stakes, uh, the four to one uh, uh, morning line uh, favorite, uh, Omaha Beach. I apologize for throwing you out completely of my top four. Uh, with that being said, I promise to give you a very strong look in my next race. Aaron, would you like to say anything to Omaha Beach? I give credit when credit is due. And um, Omaha Beach, he, he looked extremely tough. And uh, to be honest with you, and I, I've seen I've seen the replay. I don't think Game Winner would have went past them if they went to run around again. To be honest with you, I think Mike Smith was just really sitting chilly coming down the stretch. Game Winner, it took him a while to get his stride going, but o- Omaha Beach might 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 be something serious. So I, I didn't believe in him. He made me a believer for at least that race. But, uh, yeah, I, I must definitely eat crow. He, Omaha Beach did his thing. Well, you and I are now on Team Omaha Beach, man. We're going to have to, if you can't beat them, join them. We've got to obey the rules of nature. We don't make up the rules of nature. we just got to follow them. I'm, 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 fo- I'm following them right now. Following <laughs> them right now. Well, with that being said, as you uh, hear in our open, we uh, I uh, throw in the, uh, the American Pharaoh highlight because, obviously, it's a wonderful highlight of him being the first Triple Crown winner. Since the late 70s, uh, affirmed. Am I correct? That was the last one. Was, was it affirmed? Correct. Dana? Aaron? Dana's older than me. Yeah. Dana? So I, would I, defer to I saw the affirmed. That's what I, yeah. I, thought, I thought. I think Affirm was the last Triple Crown winner before American Pharaoh. But anyway. That uh, was correct. And, and, and because of the 70s was kind of the... Salad days of horse racing, and there was there was uh, multiple uh, triple crown winners, and then we had the long drought before American Farrell broke through. All right, absolutely. Well, I just uh, you know we we do play that highlight, so that's the uh, the news we want to talk about is that uh, American Farrell's father uh, passed away at the age of thirteen this week, pioneer of the Nile. Uh, so definitely some sad news. Uh, let's start with Aaron. Aaron, any comments on the uh, poor pioneer of the Nile passing away at the young age of 13? Wow, well, yeah. Uh, pioneer, pioneer of the Nile was a, uh, he was a hell of a racehorse. He was a hell of a racehorse. And, uh, you know, he had 254 winners. And um, his, uh, his runners had made over $35.1 million. So I wish as a dad that my kids can make over $35.1 million. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, Pioneer of the Nile, uh, Pioneer of the Nile is, is a is a excellent was an excellent horse, and he you know gave us American Pharaoh, a Triple Crown winner, and uh, wish he could still be around to produce more babies. But uh, rest in peace to Pioneer of the Nile. Dana. Well, my well, first of all, I, I wanted to go back to the Rebel Stakes. I didn't give the buyer speed figure for the second race. It was ninety six, which was almost the same as the first division. Uh, in terms of Pioneer of the Nile, just from my main memory of him is uh, him uh, winning in the stretch for a while in the 2009 Kentucky Derby before uh, the crazy long shot mind that bird snuck up the rail and won by five lengths, uh, which was so startling that the race caller Tom Durkin barely noticed him until, uh, until the end of the race. Um, and so, but Pioneer of the Nile obviously was a, was a top class racehorse and Probably was even better in the breeding shed than he was as a racehorse because he bred a triple crown winner. So, yeah, it's kind of 13 is pretty early for a, for a sire or any, you know, any horse to die. Usually they get to their 20s, but I don't know exactly what, what, what the issue was. But too bad because he was a hell of a sire. Absolutely. Well, I just want to say real quick, as I mentioned earlier in our pre-show, at least to Aaron, I, it's kind of funny how God works. You know, when God's done with it, he just takes you. Apparently, you know, all the pioneer, pioneer of the Nile does is produce a triple crown winner, and that's it. Off to heaven you go. Your job is done here, my son. 
That's pretty much what happens. Well, let's get our job done here, uh, my two sons, uh, <laughs> Aaron and Dana. Let's uh, move on to one of our two prep races coming up uh, this weekend, because one's on Saturday and one's on Sunday. I was going to say uh, coming up on Saturday for both of them. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to remind folks to log on to sportsradiodetroit.com, SRD. And I've been mentioning this the last couple shows. Uh, it is now out and running. The uh, Detroit Favorite Female Personality Bracket Challenge, our version of March Madness, which bleeds into mid-April, where folks can go online and vote for their favorite Detroit female fa- uh, personality. So I hope that uh, you guys do the exact same thing as well. Cast your vote. Uh, there are uh, uh, We do divisions in uh, the uh, metro Detroit area counties. So there's like a Wayne division, a Macomb division, Washtenaw division, and an Oakland division, and so on and so forth. So pick your favorite female Detroit female personality at sportsradiodetroit.com, S-R-D. So gentlemen, let's move on and pick one of 11 favorite personalities coming up in Saturday's grade two. One mile and an eighth. The races are getting longer, and the races are getting more serious for $1 million. The Twinspires.com Louisiana Derby from Fairgrounds Racecourse in New Orleans, Louisiana. Race 13 on your card. Points awarded on the road to the Derby. 100 for the win. 40 for second, 20 for third, and 10 for fourth. And before I go on, that basically means 100 points, and you're not only winning, you're in, you're definitely comfortably in the Kentucky Derby, but also 40 points seems to be the cutoff every year for Derby eligible points. So second place will earn enough points likely to enter the Derby as well. Field of 11 horses. And also this is our first race for hundred points this season. Post time set for around 513 Eastern time, weather partly cloudy, a high near 71. Again, I mentioned it's an 11 horse field. Your favorite is the six horse War of Will, Tyler Gaffalione, Mark Cassie, <coughs> six to five on the morning line. Aaron Hayes, what do you have? I'm going to take the horse who has been dominating the Louisiana circuit down there, and that's War of Will. Um, classiest horse out of the bunch, three for three with Tyler Gaffalione on him. I think this race is really going to just set up with him just sitting right behind the, the lone speed in this race, which is the uh, the two horse. There really isn't that much speed in here. So I think that he'll really just sit comfortably and Tyler will just have him just galloping along down the back stretch. And uh, once they turn for home, I think he's just going to accelerate again. This horse has, has a, a turn of foot down the stretch. I, I, I like that he extends his leaf down the stretch to the finish line. And um, him and Tyler G., Tyler Gaffalione, they have a little thing going on. So ever since he's got on them, they've been three for three. Um, and he is just the, the sharpest horse, not only in the, the circuit down there, but he might be the best horse to date that's in the Kentucky Derby prep races. I'm not too strong on the, the circuit as a whole going into Kentucky Derby, but War of Will, he, he might uh, be, the, be the exception this year. So I, I think War of Will is pretty much the best horse. He's the classiest horse. There, these I think these horses that are coming back to to race against him from the Risen Star, uh, they they I don't I don't think they really are competitive enough competitive enough to run him down. Country House was probably the closest one, but I think War of Will will get the the first jump coming down the stretch. And I think he'll be an easy winner. I think you're really just looking at the price on him is really the only uh, bad thing. Not bad thing, but the only negative will, will, uh, of War of Will will probably be he'll be an extremely heavy favorite. So I'm taking War of Will on top to win the Louisiana Derby. My second horse that I'm going to choose is the five by my standards. Now, Gabriel Saez has rode this horse off four times. He broke his mating. Um, down there at uh, Fairgrounds going a mile and 16th. And um, he set off the pace, and he closed down the stretch, and he won by four and a half lengths. And I, I think that race was a nice setup for him just to just to get his, his feet wet into this tougher competition. Obviously, he's just breaking his maiden, so you know he, he has a long way to go, and he's obviously outclassed by a lot of these horses. But I think by his race, by, by the way he... Uh, by the way, he, uh, he'll be positioned by Gabriel Sanchez. I think that he'll be in a prime position to close right behind War of Will. He had a, a, a bullet workout on March 9th, going five furlongs in 59 seconds. 
And then I like the next workout, to be honest with you. You slowed him up 49 and 4 in the slop. And I think that he will be ready to run coming down the stretch right behind War of Will. And my third choice for this race will be the 10 horse spinoff with Johnny V and Ty Pletcher. Um, this, this horse broke his maiden back in June, going five furlongs, one. And then they, uh, I think they thought pretty highly of him after that race and sent him to Saratoga to run in the grade two. Uh, didn't, didn't run too well, to be honest with you, even though he ran third, but it was only a four horse race. But he only finished two and three quarter lengths off of him with Johnny V aboard. And I don't know what specifically happened in that race, but uh, they, they put him on the shelf since August 12th. And they brought him back on February 22nd. They're running the optional clamor, and he won going away by 11 lengths. Now, that, that feel probably wasn't that much, but obviously that race was a setup for this race right here. And um, I believe that his race tactics will also benefit him. I think that he will be slightly off the lead. No further. Well, he's been no further than than a half a length or a length and a half at the first call, and um, I, I think that he'll be sitting in a prime position as well to close right behind War of Will as as well as By My Standards. So in the Louisiana Derby, I'm taking War of Will, the six horse, By My Standards, the five, and the ten horse spinoff. And with that being said, I'm gonna pass it over to Dana. All right. Well. I like War of Will, too, just because he's been dominant in those two races. And one thing I like to point out in the wrist and star stakes is that the horses who finished second, third, and fourth in that race were all in this race. Country House, Royland, and uh, Hog Creek Hustle were the three horses who were at the very back of the pack. And they all rallied to finish either in the money or finish fourth which just goes to show to me that the rest of the front runners couldn't stay with War of Will, and, and it was, the pace was kind enough to the closers. It was just that War of Will was just that much better. So I, I've got him on top. I'm going to shop around for a few long shots underneath. Uh, I like the two-horse London skate. As uh, Aaron pointed out, there's very little speed in this race, and I think Lemon Skate's going to be on the lead early on, and I think he might get a little bit brave and maybe hang in there for second or third. He uh, was nominated for the Triple Crown, even though he didn't start his first race until January 19th. He lost his first two races, but his second race was pretty solid. He was running on the front end at six furlongs at Gulfstream Park, finished second. The rest, of the, horses, the rest of the horses in that field were way back, and he earned a pretty good speed figure. Then they threw him on the turf at a mile and 16th, and he went wire to wire. Kenneth McPeak was the trainer. His horses tend to get better with racing. His jockey, uh, Brian Hernandez, is a, one of the more underrated jockeys, especially in these bigger races. So I kind of like them as a sneaky long shot to finish second. My third choice is one of the horses I already mentioned, which was Royland. He's on the rail. This horse, they tried to put blinkers on him and everything. He just breaks badly every race. He's just a, one of those horses that lopes along and then makes a big run late. He was eleventh <coughs> in the stretch of the Rosen Star Stakes, and he passed everybody but War of Will and Country House. He made up five lengths in the strengths, five lengths in the stretch, and passed most of the field. So obviously, he should like to be a little bit of an added distance here. And I'm sure he'll be a pretty good price here. So I, I, I like him as a as a closer and get into the money. And the other horse I like is the seven horse, Mr. Money. Made his first start of the three-year-old campaign in the Risen Star Stakes. This horse ran in the British Cup Juvenile and finished a decent fourth. And then middle moved in the Risen Star and then backed up in the stretch. I think he needed that race, and I think he'll improve off that effort. So... I'm going to put War of Will, who was the six horse here, on top, just like Aaron did. But I'm going to go with some long shots. The two, Lemniscate, the three, Royland. Excuse me, the one, Royland, and seven horse, Mr. Money. With that, I'll give it to Pete. Well, I appreciate that very much, gentlemen. Thanks very much for your breakdowns. I really sort of agree with you guys that I think that uh, – Good old six horse war of will at six to five on the morning line with Tyler Gaffleon and Mark Cassie should be the morning line favorite and probably the easy winner of Saturday's grade two. 
one mile and an eighth uh, Louisiana Derby from Fairgrounds Race Course. Before I get in fully into my breakdown, I want to let everybody know what I think the race pace is going to be. Uh, I agree with you, Dana. I think that the two, Lemon Escape, is going to go out for the lead with the six, War of Will, sort of breathing, sort of breathing down his neck, and the 10 spinoff out there as well. So the two, six, and 10 in the first tier. I see the four, Sueno, the five, uh, by my standards, the seven, Mr. Money, and 11, Hog Creek Hustle, actually in the second tier, followed by the one, Royland, the three, Limonite, and the eight, Country House, with Banquet as well in the third tier as they leave the gate. Uh, I really do see a lot of speed up front, especially with, um, uh, you know, you got a 15 to 1 underdog in Lemna Skate. Uh, he's going to be trying to wear out War of Will, but War of Will is not easily bullied. I think War of Will will sit there definitely in the stalking spot at number two. Uh, right there as uh, he's being tried, tries to be bullied by spinoff there uh, early on in the lead. But that's definitely going to allow uh, a, a horse like Sueno, who I really, the four-horse Sueno, I really think has a chance to kind of gather up a lot of tired horses here late in the race. Uh, I think that Corey Lannery uh, jumping on his back has definitely improved the speed of Sueno. And especially, well, you know, you, know, you also have to look at how good was the Southwest uh, with Super Steed on on top as a you know as a major underdog, but he did, but Sueno did beat Long Range Toddy. So, you know, what does that mean for Sueno since Long Range Toddy won uh, one of the Rebel Stakes, uh, uh, won the first division of the Rebel Stakes? Uh, you know, Sueno has to has to say something for Sueno, and I think Sueno is definitely on the improve. So I think that uh, I definitely like the six uh, War of Will uh, to be first, but I think that you know coming from that second tier, I think you have to look at the four Sueno. But with all that speed up front, obviously it, uh, that opens up the door for the eight-horse Country House, uh, one of the third-tier horses, to be a late closer. Now, the only problem with Country House is that he can never get out of the gate cleanly. But even when he doesn't get out of the gate cleanly, he finishes either second or first. So my whole point is that if he can get a nice, clean start, I mean, look at his last comments uh, in the Risen Star Stakes, stakes Great too, with Luis Saez on his back. Uh, he lost to War of Will by two, two and a quarter lengths, but he was off slow, five, wa- five wide, and he lugged in. Uh, and, and then look at the line uh, below him and his maiden when he won his maiden. Uh, slow early and then impressive. So my whole point is that if Country House can get out of the gates and maybe want, be one of the earlier, uh, one of the closer uh, closer horse, you know, like right sitting like right there in seventh or something like that, I think that that might be a perfect place for Country House to come close late on the leaders. So I really see this the uh, the playing with the four, six, and the eight as definitely uh, one of the uh, the top three horses. Um, as Dana likes to say, you know, pull out the wheel for uh, the fourth spot and hope one of the uh, one of the crazy horses like Mister Money will follow uh, in from the uh, from the uh, uh, second tier as well. But I really think that um, I, I like the one, uh, the Ron Roiland, especially being on the gate uh, or on the rail to start this race. I think that he's in a good spot to do it. So I'm going to play with the one, four, six, eight uh, as my picks uh, in that race uh, with the six on top being War of Will. But watch out for the eight country house. Gentlemen, any more comments, starting with Dana? Uh, I'm, I'm good. I'm just, I said I, it's really hard to beat War of Will in this race and so that's why I, I was looking at the, at the deep long shots that give, give, give me some sort of a price in this race. Absolutely. Aaron? Another deep long shot that I'll, I'll take another look at that might, I won't say overlooked, but it will be the number nine banquet. Um, I, I got to respect Steve Asmussen. And um, I read, may, may, I, I think banquet wasn't uh, really filling Oak line. He just didn't really fire there, didn't have, uh, a good run in the Smarty Jones or the, Smart, uh, or the Southwest. But uh, Irad is back on him, and he's 20-1. to 1. So Irad, Steve Asmussen, 20-1. That 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 can I, – I think I might throw him in the trifecta underneath. And Irad has won with him closing from off the pace. I don't think he will win. But um, Irad back on him, he can probably close and maybe hit the board. So I'll take a, take a look at Bankett to uh, possibly hit the board. Okay, well, we will definitely find out on Saturday, somewhere around 5.13 Eastern Standard Time. So with that, gentlemen, let's move on to our second race. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to remind everybody to log on to SportsRadioDetroit.com SRD and check out the latest episodes of the Out of Bounds podcast 
with Dan and Dave as they talk the latest sports topics around the country, not just in Detroit, but around the country, around the world, and also break down any sort of pop culture topics as well, the latest news, and sort of see what's going on in the world. That's Out of Bounds Podcast with Dan and Dave, only on Sports Radio Detroit.com, SRD. So with that, gentlemen, let's move on to Sunday's. Uh, let's see. Uh, it would be helpful if I have the notes out here, but Sunday's grade three, one mile and an eighth. And these uh, horses are racing for $800,000. And that is going to be the Sunland Derby from Sunland Park in Sunland Park, New Mexico, which is near El Paso, okay. Texas. How about that? Uh, this is going to be race 11 on your card. Points awarded on the road to the Kentucky Derby, 50 for the win. So win and you're in the Kentucky Derby. 20 for the uh, place, 10 for third, and 5 for fourth. A field of 10 horses. Post time set for around 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. Weather for New Mexico, partly cloudy, high near 75. So a nice day for racing out there. It is very dirty out there. In New Mexico. So, Aaron, how dirty are your picks? And I mean that respectfully, uh, New Mexico. I mean that respectfully. <laughs> it's just very dusty out there. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I think my picks are kind of clean this time. I'm going to go with the two horse, another twisted fate. And I'm going on faith with this horse because I don't know what to do with this horse because his last only three wins have come on the all weather at Golden Gate. But he has a uh, tremendous uh, front end speed, and I think he will be on the lead. Uh, Juan Hernandez comes in to ride for uh, Blaine Wright. They they ship in from uh from the Bay Area, and what I what I do like about this horse was that his last one in the El Camino, they ran a mile and the eighth, and he's the only horse to go this distance. And um in the stretch he was up by six lengths and he won by seven, and he pulled away and he he won pretty convincingly. Now translating that over to Sunland in New Mexico with the altitude and the dirt and everything, I I am completely I have no idea how this will translate, but I believe that if he can get the lead and he looks like he's a pretty strong uh, foe on the lead, I believe that he will be tough to catch. So uh, I'm hoping that his form can translate over from the all weather to the dirt. And if they if he, if it does, I, th- I think another twisted fate would be extremely tough to beat on the lead. So I'll take another twisted fate with my top pick. Uh, my second pick will have to be uh, Mucho Gusto. I got to respect uh, Bob Baffert. Um, I, 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 he has to hit the board. I don't see Bob Baffert shipping somewhere for a Kentucky Derby prep race and his horse is not hitting the board. So I believe that he will sit right behind uh, another twisted fate. He can either go to the lead or, or, or stalk, but I, I, don't, I don't think that he wants to get into a, uh, a speed duel early. I think Joe Talamo will pretty much sit right off the lead like he did in his last race. I don't know what to do with his last race as well because in the Robert Lewis, there's only five horses. Um, one of them didn't finish. But uh, in, in the slop, in the mile 16th, I, I, don't, I don't know what to really do with that race. He won by four and three-quarter lengths convincingly. He has a gun middle gray and an uh, easy shot. So I, I, I really don't know what to do with that race. He did run a 95 uh, speed briz, uh, brisnet speed rating. With that, and uh, you know that is also encouraging, but I, I don't really know what to do with that with that sloppy track at Santa Anita. I don't know if there's a product of, of the slop or is, is he just that good. But I think that he was sit right off a of twisted fate. Those two will probably do it on the stretch, but I think another twisted fate will probably outlast mucho gusto. And for my third pick, I am going with Cutting Humor. Uh, Ty Pletcher is shipping in with uh, Johnny V, and those those two are always. Uh, always a, a tough out together. Um, they're shipping in from the Southwest, which he didn't, he was the favorite, but didn't run well at all. So I, th- I think that Todd is really just shipping him out here, just trying to get some uh, some derby points. Uh, but if he can possibly get second, that's uh, what, what, 40 points or no, 20 points. Yeah, it'd be 20. 20 points to the, 20 points to the second uh, place horse. So he could possibly win it too, who knows. But I think that's the only reason why Todd is shipping him out here, that he thinks he has a viable chance of getting some of those points to get in. I, I have no idea how the full derby pitcher is with the Rebel being split in half with the points kind of being cut in half with the, the two Rebel races. So, uh, you know, 20 points if he gets second. and Maybe, maybe he can uh, possibly make it into the derby. But 
I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Cutting Humor as my third pick. I think that he would uh he'll be sitting far off the pace, not far off, but he'll he'll be stalking behind the two uh, horses that I that I picked, and I think Johnny V will come running ro- rolling mate, and uh, possibly get second or third, more likely third to be honest with you, because I don't see uh, anybody getting close to another Twisted Fate or Mucho Gusto, so I'm taking another Twisted Fate on top, uh, Mucho Gusto second, and Cutting Humor to run third, and I'm going to pass it over to Dana. Well. Uh... Another twist of fate. Here's a, here's a uh, little factoid since we were talking about Triple Crown sires. Scat Daddy was the sire of Justify who won the Triple Crown. So you would think this horse would probably like the dirt, but he seems to be more suited for the synthetic. I don't know. We'll find out uh, uh, on Saturday. But the problem I have with this, another twist of fate is the horse right next to him, Hustle Up, just loves to go to the front and he's a horse is running, you know, some pretty fast fractions, so I'm wondering how that all is going to play out. It might just be a big speed duel. I'm counting on a big speed duel because I'm going to pick Cutting Uter as my top pick. The five horse, Fletcher and Val Velasquez, two back when he started his three-year-old campaign. He, he finished a pretty solid second at Gulfstream Park to Bourbon War, who came back and ran a really strong race in one of the Florida preps and finished second. And so that, 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 that race flattered him. So I think uh, Cutting Humor is a pretty solid. I mean, he did, as, as Aaron pointed out, he was the favorite in the Southwest and made a big middle move and tired, but that, that race kind of fell apart with, the, with the, a lot of the uh, closers benefiting. I think Cutting Humor, just the fact that Fletcher is still persevering with this horse, really thinks this horse has some talent, and I think he's going to pull an upset here if he gets the pace. Uh, my second choice will be Mucho Gusto. He's been very solid. Hard to knock him. The only, the only horse he's lost to is improbable. Um, so I think he'll, he'll, he'll sit about third or fourth behind the two front runners and should get, should get a share pretty, uh, pretty easily. And my, my third choice is going to be Steve Asmussen's horse, the four horse Wicked Indeed, who ran second in the, uh, prep race here at Sunland Park for for this particular race, the Mind mine at Bird Derby. He finished second in that behind Hustle Up, who got loose on the lead. So I think a Wicked Indeed is going to hit the board, finish third. So my picks are going to be Five Cutting Humor, who has a clever name, by the way. First Samurai is a sire, and the dam is Pud. Uh, he's going to be my top choice. Mucho Gosto, number two. Uh, and then my third choice is going to be the four horse, Wicked Indeed. But that, I'll pass it over to Pete. I appreciate your breakdown there, gen- breakdowns there, gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, really kind of a odd uh, board when you take a look at it because I was kind of thrown off when I first took a look at it. The odds are sort of in order of, like, the horse. It's kind of the odds go in order. The morning line odds is kind of funny. The one horse is 8 to 5, the... Two horses, three to one. The three is five to one. The four is six to one, and so on and so forth. It gets gets worse as it goes down. It's kind of odd. So before you take a look at the program and just throw out the second page, uh, I just want to uh, remind everybody that when there's a lot of speed up front, uh, no matter what the odds are, usually that means a horse is going to come from behind, not necessarily to win, but uh, will definitely be in play later on the race. But unfortunately, that horse uh, won't win, so I'll get to that uh, pick coming up here a little bit. Uh, but definitely, yeah, I really, it's uh, kind of a tough race to look at. I think it's a lot tougher than the odds make it out to be. I think it really is a battle between the one, two, three, and the uh, five, uh, those those four horses. Uh, before I get into my breakdown, I'll just uh, let everybody know what I think the race pace is going to be. It's going to be really weird up front because you've got about five horses that really want to be on the lead or at least being bullies to the lead. Uh, I see the one, two, three, six, and nine uh, basically in the first tier, uh, you know, creating a pace with those five horses basically up front. Uh, four, five, and eight will be in the second tier, followed by the seven, 10, 11 in the third tier. Um, you know, you got to remember that the three horse hustle up. He's like the Sunland uh, veteran. Uh, he's also like a Sunland bully. He doesn't like people coming into his racetrack, his racetrack, and winning. Uh, so, you know, I really think. Uh, that Shane LaViolette and Todd Fincher are not showing up to be five to one morning line fair uh, morning line uh, odds a third favorite to 
you know, play fodder to, uh, you know, another twist of fate or mucho gusto or even cutting humor. I think that Hustle Up is definitely not only going to go out for the lead, but try to win it from gate to finish and just say, you know, come and get me. Uh, I think that Mucho Gusto having the uh, gate or having the the uh, uh, a rail in this race, I think, can only help him compete against Hustle Up and Hustle Up's uh, early speed. Uh, another twist of fate again is going to go out and push the pace as well, if not want the lead as well. It's 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 really really tough. So I, I'll get into the horse that I was thinking on the second page before you start shredding the second page and say what's the point. Uh, take a look at the seven, uh, Passamonte Man. I think Passamonte Man really uh, has the skills uh, to be there late. Uh, very patient horse. Finished fourth last time out uh, in the Mind That Bird Derby uh, from Sunland Park at a mile and 16th. And uh, it's, you know, it, it's, he, I mean, he finished, you know, he finished behind Hustle Up and Wicked Indeed and Walker Stalker. But I, I, I think that it, I don't know if the pace in that race was as fast as it's going to be in this one. So I really think that uh, Passamonte Man, uh, the seven horse, is really going to be there in the end. But it's really hard to go against the one, two, three, or five. But I think everybody, I think you guys, especially Dana, is right about cutting humor. I think that uh, Todd Pletcher and uh, Johnny Velasquez uh, are a good combination. Aaron also said that as well. But again, how good was that Southwest? Uh, with a big time underdog underneath, but I just gave credit credit to Sueno and Long Range Toddy just uh, had a big win in the Rebel. Uh, so I guess cutting humor uh, would be a good horse to pick. But I'm going to stick with Mucho Gusto. I know it sounds kind of weird, but the Morning Line favorite. I'm going to stick with the eight to five Morning Line favorite. Uh, sounds very very boring, but I'm going to try to make money by having that seven come in, hopefully third in a Superfecta. But I think another twist of fate. Um, you know, I, I, again, how is he going to react to being off the artificial surface and onto the regular dirt? I guess we will definitely find out. He didn't do so well in the six furlong maiden last time he tried it on the regular dirt from Santa Anita. So let's see how it pans out. So I'm going to take the proven veteran or the proven winner, at least so far. Uh, I'm going to try with mucho gusto, uh, on top, but I definitely see it to be the one and the uh, five. I definitely think will be your top two horses. I see the uh, the two, three, and seven being there as well. But if I have to take one horse out, I'm actually going to take out um, uh, probably the three, hustle up, even though he is the track bully, and just stick with the one, two, five, seven. Uh, but that is really about all I have to say, gentlemen. Uh, starting with Aaron, any more comments on Sunland? Uh, another horse that I, I think that that can definitely be in the money is the four horse Wicked Indeed, um, and it, just off the strength alone of of Luis uh, Contreras. He has 53 wins and 174 starts. So, I mean, he is absolutely killing. That's virtually one out of every three races he's winning out there. And he's in the money 106 times out of 174 times. So just the angle alone of just the, the top jockey out there and just familiar with being in Sunland and the, the altitude in, in New Mexico, maybe that uh, have a slight benefit towards him. And uh, he, like you said, he did close from off the pace. He was coming strong too. He if if the race was a slightly longer, he would have got to hustle up. So, wicked indeed. He can definitely uh, be in the money without a doubt. Gotcha, Dana. Uh, with in terms of the sun line, I, I guess the only thing we I don't know if we mentioned this was that I I believe the uh, Baffert Hort was rerouted there after all the craziness of Santa Anita. I, I believe that that's what happened. That's why yeah, yeah. Mucho Gusto is one of the refugees. <laughs> <laughs> he is a Santa Anita refugee. That was on the show. I don't think Aaron was with us. Aaron, have you ever referred to a horse before as a refugee? Not until today. Well, that's what I'm telling you, man. Since Santa Anita started going crazy over there, you got a lot of refugees looking for homes. And your yeah. your guys' well, retirement might... villa seems to be the place where they all wanted to go. Hey, well, he might find one in uh, New Mexico. Well, I... I... Bob Baffert can find wins anywhere. He can find wins in Alaska if he had to go there. Well, gentlemen, right. uh, that pretty much does it for our show here, breaking down the Louisiana Derby and the Sunland Derby coming up for our next show. We have two races to break down, and uh, they are both on the 30th, which I believe is a Saturday, yes. And that would be the UAE Derby from Maidan Racecourse over there in the United Arab Emirates. And then we have the Florida Derby from the Great Gulf Stream Park in Hollandale Beach, Florida. 
Both those races are 100-point races with 40 going to second. So, again, two horses from those fields will definitely qualify for the Derby. So we get four, basically four qualifiers coming up uh, in our next show. Gentlemen, that is what we cool. will do. So that is pretty much ending it for us. Don't forget to tune into other shows and podcasts here on sportsradiodetroit.com, including the Out of Bounds podcast, Parsons and Slow, Pearson's Peace, the Set Piece, Armchair Sports Talk, Mitten Sports Talk, Grave Discussions, the Laugh Track, Spinning the Wheels, SRD Ringside, Wings, SRD, Pistons, Lions, and Tigers, SRD. And don't forget to check back for more of the Whip and Nene podcast as the Triple Crown season progresses. So thanks very much for listening. A reminder, I am Pete Spivak. You can find me doing sports updates and traffic updates in Detroit on all the iHeart Media stations in the afternoon. And you can find me on Twitter at Son of USFL Dad. And Dana, where can folks find you? D Garuder on Twitter. Aaron? You can holler at me at Twitter on AHAS24. You, the man, appreciate everybody's help today. And I appreciate all of our listeners. Thanks very much for listening. Remember what Stan Laurel says you can lead a horse to water. But a pencil must be led. Good luck, hail, and farewell. This has been an SRD production.